Good morning. I'm Greg Kaur, the Director of the Monitoring and State Improvement Planning Division and OSEP, and I wanted to welcome you to day two of the 2021 OSEP Leadership and Project Directors Conference, otherwise known as the Mega Conference. I wanted to take a moment to thank the OSEP Conference Planning Committee for putting together this huge event which is being held for the first time on a virtual platform. We've certainly learned much and been stretched a lot over the last year and a half, um, extending our virtual capacity and creatively partnering with you as you continue to provide early intervention, special ed services and technical assistance. We had a great start yesterday, I hope you agree. Um, there were over 2,000, I actually heard 2,100 participants in the plenary session. So it's just, just amazing. Uh, one of the uh, advantages, I suppose, of doing this uh, with COVID is we were able to do this virtually and actually impact even uh, greater people, numbers of people in our audience. So that's great. I was very inspired to hear the remarks of Secretary Card Cardona and his commitment to children and families and his commitment to equity. And then Cornelius Minor really set the stage in a passionate and compelling, compelling opening keynote. I wanna thank our own Perry Williams and the panelists who helped bring Cornelius's messages closer to our work. I think you'll find that today's lineup is equally impressive after I finish my presentation, I'll provide an overview of the rest of this morning's speakers. Uh, but before I get started with the MSIP updates, I wanted to share some personal information with you. Um, um, I'm wearing a suit and um, this is the first time, it's, it's remarkable, it's the first time in, um, I can't remember how long, probably over a year, um, both my kids were kind of amazed uh, when they saw me come downstairs today. Um, but I'm wearing a suit and I'm wearing uh, both the jacket and the pants, which you can't see. Um, like many of you, I have been working from home since March, 2020, um, along with my wife, Jennifer, and uh, we have continued to shepherd our two children through over a year of virtual schooling. And it hasn't been easy. Uh, our daughter, Evie, and I've in the past, if you've been to these conferences, you've seen me share uh, pictures and videos of Evie and Liam. Evie is now 14, believe it or not, and she'll be entering high school in September, we hope in person. Um, Liam is 12 and he'll be moving up to seventh grade in a, a DC charter school. So there've been lots, and lots of ups and downs this year as we negotiated their virtual platforms, um, but we made it uh, this far uh, successfully and everyone in the family is successfully fully vaccinated. So that's a, that's a, a relief for all of us. I hope that all of you are able to get your vaccinations as well. Um, we know there are still lots of questions about health and safety and the emergence of the, the COVID variant as we approach the beginning of the 21-22 school year. But we're hopeful that we'll be able to return to some sort of normal um, as the next school year approaches. Now, back to the MSIP update. We have, and there's the slides right on cue. I didn't even have to ask for them. Um, we have faced an unprecedented year and a half weathering the impact of COVID-19. During this period in MSIP and OSEP, we've tried to be responsive um, and the impact of COVID-19 is reflected through everything that we've done. We've been working on back to school guidance that will be issued uh, beginning in August on various topics, but uh, many of those uh, topics are addressing key questions that have come in from the field. The guidance that we'll be releasing will build on 
uh, frequently asked questions documents that we generated between March and September of 2020 in response to questions we were receiving from states, localities, parents, and other stakeholders. Um, additionally, uh, not related to COVID, but of interest, I think, is that um, we are soon releasing an FAQ on private school equitable services. It's making its way through department clearance right now. And we hope that it will be developed, I'm sorry, available later this summer. If we could go to the next slide. And then the slide after that, there. Okay, OSEP's vision. At MSIP this past year, we've done some work on articulating our values, our vision, and mission, and reflected on the why of all that we do. I don't know if any of you have done similar things in, in your workplaces, uh, but we felt like this was a great opportunity for us to kind of reset um, reflect on why we're doing what we do and um, develop some statements that can serve as our, our, our North Star. So what you see here on the screen is the vision statement that we created. Um, I know you can, you can read, but I'll, I just wanna read it because I think it's a powerful statement. Driving excellent outcomes for infants, toddlers, children and youth with disabilities and their families through monitoring and supporting states. And those are the two major functions uh, that we carry out in MSIP. So I wanted to share that with you. You'll see that reflected in our e-signatures um, on our emails and messages that we send out. And it has served as our, our guiding work over the past year. Next slide, please. Uh, as I'm sure is the case for you, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic has impacted everything that we do in MSIP. Um, our major functions that you probably know about, particularly if you're a state person, are um, the review of state performance plans, APRs, um, the review of uh, applications for the IDEA formula grant funds um, so, that, so, the, so that those funds can be released in July uh, of each year. And also um, carrying on monitoring. Those are three uh, critical functions that we carry out. So I'll talk first about the SPP APRs. We were able to issue our 2021 determinations on time this year, despite many challenges, the Part C determinations were issued on uh, June 22nd and Part B two, two days later on June 24th. Recognizing that states would have difficulty, would likely have difficulty collecting the data that they need for the indicators we gave states the opportunity to comment on the impact of COVID-19 in collecting the data um, for each of the indicators that was impacted. And uh, to no one's surprise, I believe every state took advantage of this opportunity and explained why they had difficulty collecting complete data sets or collecting valid and reliable data because of um, interruptions uh, and challenges posed by COVID-19 and the closing of schools and the interruption of early intervention services. We also made a decision um, in the spring that no state that had data that was negatively impacted by COVID-19 would be placed in the needs intervention category solely as a result of this compromised data. Um, and in the past, we've had uh, situations where we 
used a similar rule. Um, I know in uh, Virgin Islands, which was impacted by the hurricane several years ago, uh, we, we acted similarly. I did want to point, so as, as a result, no state um, was in needs intervention this year. This is the first time historically since we started making determinations that that was the case. Uh, I did want to point out though that for states that continue to have long-standing compliance issues, we were able to continue to take enforcement action uh, through imposing sp specific conditions on their grant awards uh, and or uh, making sure that they complete corrective actions. The SPP APR fact sheet and determination letters are already posted on our IDEA website. You can go to the link here if you want to look at the, uh, the fact sheets or the uh, letters for particular states. Um, the actual state APRs will be posted uh, later, later this month. We'll be sending out more information on that once those become available. We recognize that um, you know, this last year, COVID only impacted about three months of the data collection period, the last three months of the 1920 program year. Um, we're anticipating that it will have a much greater impact uh, in this coming year since for many localities, schools were closed for most of the year, if not the entire year, and early intervention services were also interrupted. Um, so we are anticipating that we will have probably an even more serious impact on uh, data in the coming year. I wanted to let you know that we, we will be holding a monthly technical assistance call on August 12th, that's a Thursday at four o'clock. We'll be doing uh, a couple things. One is that uh, if you're a state, you I'm sure know that we are in the first year of a new um, information collection package, which was finalized last year. Um, so this will be the first year that you'll be reporting data from that new information collection package. So we'll uh, talk to you about what's different in that package from what you had done previously. We'll also talk a little bit about, uh, again, about the impact of COVID going forward. If we could move to the next slide. Grant awards. So the second uh, big bucket that I want to comment on is the grant award process. Um, the program implementation team, like the data implementation team, has worked very hard this year to ensure that uh, all the grant awards were approved and that the funds were available by July 1st. In addition to the substantial increase in the regular allocations for the IDEA formula awards, um, the American Rescue Plan provided an additional $5.8 billion for the 611 school age grant, $200 million for the preschool 619 grant, and $250 million for Part C early intervention services. As others have pointed out uh, during their presentations uh, yesterday, these funds are subject to the same requirements as the regular IDEA funds and are available for the same 27 month period for, for obligation. For more information about the ARP funds, please access the new uh, ARP fact sheet, which is available on our website. You can see the, the link there. The uh, FFY 2021 grant award letters will be posted on our website during the end of July. Because of COVID, um, states were not able to, uh, in May, not all states, but most states were unable to submit hard copies with wet signatures, which is unfortunately um, a, a continuing uh, um, requirement. They were not able to submit them by the, the May deadline. So we gave states an extension that they can submit those by August 2nd, and we will be collecting those uh, in our office. 
Part C programs need to submit a revised section three uh, document, use of funds regarding the use of ARP funds, which is also due on August 2nd. Um, okay. And one last thing I wanted to mention about grants and I see I'm running short on time. Um, be because we exceeded the $460 million threshold uh, in the statute and regulations, we were able to use a portion of the additional money beyond that threshold for state incentive grants for those states who wanted to continue providing services um, to infants and toddlers beyond age three up until the point they reach the age where they can enter kindergarten. So this year, uh, three states were able to uh, be, become eligible for those funds. And we're working with a couple more states who, who may become eligible sometime during the year. Because of the ARP funds, a considerable amount of money was available this year. So we're hoping that um, you know, those additional two states can take advantage of it. We're also anticipating that there will be additional money in the coming year, in the FFY 2022 year, so that more states can take advantage of the state incentive grant funds. Next slide, please. Last thing I wanna comment on briefly is uh, differentiated monitoring and support, DMS. Um, we have been using a differentiated monitoring system for some time. We were selecting states based on a risk analysis in the last several years. Although there were a lot of merits to that, we recognized that there were a number of states that we were never able to get to because they didn't uh, get triggered by the risk system. So we have um, developed a new system, DMS 2.0, which is cyclical. Every state will be monitored uh, in a, during a five-year period. Each state will go through a three-phase process, a year of preparation where we work closely with the state, a year where we conduct monitoring either on-site or virtual, um, and then the third year, uh, phase three, as we're calling it, will be devoted to uh, taking any corrective actions that are necessary to address identified noncompliance and or providing uh, accessing TA to continue to improve results for children with disabilities. Early in this year, uh, okay, let me back up. We, we launched DMS 2.0 in October of 2020 and began working through the, the process. But we realized uh, by uh, late January, early February of this year that um, we needed to pivot. We needed to really emphasize the importance of supporting states so that um, they can continue to provide virtual services or um, plan for re-entry into in-person services. So we pivoted our monitoring activities and began providing universal technical assistance, as well as um, conducting calls with every state around their policies and procedures and practices to ensure that FAPE continued to be provided and the appropriate early intervention services need, continue to be provided despite the pandemic. We uh, anticipate resuming our DMS 2.0 activities, moving away from pivot back into uh, working with states in the first cohort around uh, phase one, the preparation period. So uh, if you're in a state, please stay tuned for that. There are eight states that we're working with for a total of 16 programs because we monitor B and C uh, in the same cohort. So we expect to be, um, moving back to uh, resuming our activities in October. Next slide, please. And I'm going to start winding up here. As a reminder, we have a wealth of resources on our website. 
the IDEA website was reorganized to give you a one-stop launching point to access all of our content. Just refer to the appropriate tab after you've clicked on the website. So if you wanna to go to SPPAPR, click on that. Similarly for grants, um, DMS or physical concerns. I also wanna recognize all the incredible support provided by our OSEP funded technical assistance centers. Throughout the year, we have been collaborating extensively with our RTP colleagues and um, our TA providers to ensure that TA resources are available to states and are aligned with state needs. Uh, we work very closely with RTP. Uh, I am in daily contact with my colleague, uh, Larry Wexler, so we can coordinate the two divisions uh, activities. Um, I want to recognize all of our staff in OSEP who have continued to um, produce under very challenging circumstances. Uh, the SPPA PR activities led by Jennifer Wolfsheimer and Christine Pilgrim um, were on time despite many challenges. I know they put in late evenings and worked weekends for uh, quite a bit of time. Similarly with um, Jennifer Simpson and Al Jones and um, Grant Awards and um, Matt Schneer and um, Kate Moran around the DMS activities. Okay. Um, I wanna transition then to what's, what's in store for you for the rest of the morning. I'm excited that there will, the next panel will include a fireside chat with Ed's new uh, Deputy Secretary, Cindy Martin, and our even newer Acting Assistant Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary of OSERS, Katie Neese, who I think you met yesterday, but we'll be hearing more from both Katie and Cindy. After their conversation, we will hear from Gabriella Garbero, a member of the Dream Board Student Advisory Panel and a recent law school graduate. And then you've heard the buzz about this year's National Teacher of the Year. The morning session will end with some words from Juliana Ertebe. Um, you'll be amazed with uh, this special educator and some of her special interests. So that's what you've got uh, in store. Um, but for those of you who are not aware, uh, we wanna uh, queue up a, a video for you that um, really delves into OSEP's origin story. It's my honor to share with you today, OSEP Behind the Music. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I just want to thank everyone for joining today. What a great conference. And all of you play such important roles, whether you're state leaders, local leaders, your project directors, parents, of course, data managers and professors, teachers, practitioners, advocates, so many people joining us. And I just want to thank you. It means so much to us. What we do is we're able to advance education equity for students with disabilities across our country. And I want a heartfelt thanks to go to all of you. Thank you. And I want to introduce Katie Neese. She's our incoming acting assistant secretary in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. And Katie, I want to welcome you to the department. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. So good to have you here and to have us be able to do this important event today with everybody. And I think you could talk a little bit about your background and about what brings you to this work. I know you've been a disability ally for a long time and maybe you wanna say a little bit about that. Sure, thank you. And, and I wanna add my welcome to the conference. I'm excited to be here and uh, really glad to be able to participate. 
Um, as most of you know, I joke if you're over if you're over 40, you've heard of Easter Seals and you've probably heard of my time there. And if you're under 40, you're saying, who is that person? Um, well, I'm I've been, as Cindy said, I've been a disability ally um, since the late 1980s when I got my first job working on the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Disability Policy. Where I had the great fortune of being one of two staffers working almost exclusively on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, I learned a lot being able to work with all aspects of the disability community during that time. And I also worked a lot on, on IDEA and, and early childhood parts of IDEA. And I would say that the ADA and the promise of IDEA are part of who I am and part of how I approach um, this great opportunity that I have to work with the folks at the Department of Education. That's wonderful. And I just, I, I know that you've done so much great work and you put it back to your work and even in the Easter Seals, but it's a long, a long journey that you have had about, about serving children. I appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I, I work, the bulk of my career has been at Easter Seals, which is a disability service nonprofit provider. And there I worked closely with our staff and clients to shape public policy for children and adults with disabilities and their families. Um, and I think the pandemic has been hard on, on everybody, but it's been especially hard on children with disabilities and especially those children who, children of color. Um, I think they've had the hardest time so I'm really looking forward to working um, with all of you on solutions on how we can uh, take this historic opportunity to really improve um, access and opportunity for the kids that we've all dedicated our lives to, to helping be independent, productive members of our communities. Absolutely. Well, you know, a little bit as we get to start to work together and with the fine group of people that are joining today, I have a long personal history and professional history in education and my work with children and students with disabilities in particular. And I want to just start by saying that the reason I became a teacher is because of my brother, Charlie. And he has developmental disabilities. He's the most important person in my life. I'm still very much connected to him. Every Saturday we have lunch together. That's going to be the hardest part about taking on my new role is he doesn't quite understand that I, his big sister is moving to D.C., um, but he thinks I'm moving in with the president, actually. So we're, I'm helping Charlie with social stories. I'm working with his team to put all that together. But what I experienced being a sibling of a person with, with disabilities like Charlie is I saw my mother's deep commitment and her commitment to ensuring that Charlie got a great education. And I saw what it took as a family for all the differences that all the teachers made in his life from the time he was very little when the doctors told my family to not expect much. And they didn't know what Charlie would ever be able to do or become. And the fact that he learned to read and learned to do things that they said weren't possible. I know that my need and my desire to serve students with disabilities is deeply personal. And I learned that in my own home. I learned that purposeful, targeted, supportive environments for students where inclusion is at the forefront, I learned that it matters. And then as a teacher and a principal and a superintendent, this is my 32nd year in education. And all of the roles that I've played, starting as teacher, principal, vice principal, superintendent, what I learned firsthand was the importance of training. And I learned what it takes to effectively prepare teachers so that they can serve students and their families. And to this day, I continue to be very involved in my brother's life going forward. And as a lifelong learner, I still participate in his team meetings. And I'm grateful that we have such terrific partnerships and people that help us to help him succeed. And I bring that with me to my new role. Yeah. Cindy, um, I really appreciate your sharing that. Um, in my experience with Easter Seals and particularly families with babies with disabilities, oftentimes what they heard from the medical profession, and I'm not trashing the medical profession, but this is what a lot of the families that we served heard was a long list of things that their child would never do. And by the time they got to us, um, we would always start the conversation is, what do you want for your child? What do you want for your family? And then let's figure out how to do that. Um, I think that sort of notion of optimism that's grounded in experience is something that 
the group of folks in this room understand better than anybody. But we know that doesn't just happen uh, miraculously and that professional development is really, really important. Can you talk a little bit about what your hopes are or how we deal with the shortages of people across the board to um, be those educators, those individuals, those adults in the building who can uh, really make the difference for these kids and their families. Yeah, you, you, you're exactly right. That's why training matters so much. And what do we do to support the educators and coming into the role? And how is there from the, the whole teacher pipeline coming into the education that they're getting the kinds of experiences that they need. And I love that you connected it to start with the families and say, what are your hopes and dreams for your child? And how do we partner with you in the education field to help you realize the potential of your students? And I think that that's our work. That's what we can do together. And I'm thinking as you step into this new role, Katie, and, and thinking, about the big role that you're getting to step into and that you're undertaking. We're so grateful for that. Can you, I think people would love to hear you share a little bit more about what you're thinking of some of the key issues that are facing early childhood, special education, and the things that you're, you're passionate about. I mean, I'll talk about for myself, like I believe I'll start and then you can add on to it that I think we have to, first of all, think about how we're going to make up for learning loss. We know our students have experienced losses and especially students with disabilities during the pandemic. How can we capitalize on the lessons around accessibility and connectivity that we've learned during the pandemic? And how are we gonna reopen our schools with the commitment, redoubling this commitment to equity? How do we sustain this commitment by addressing any of the barriers and the inequities that were there before the pandemic but particularly for students with disabilities long before the pandemic started. What are yeah. your thoughts on that? So um, people who know me have heard me say this before, but I really do that world believe that world peace can be achieved through inclusive early education. I, I just do. Um, I, I think the more we can support children um, who are not all the same to be together when they're little and their parents to all be parents of 18 month old kids when they're together, when they're starting their journey, um, makes for stronger communities. Um, over the over the decades, we've seen real progress in, in really enhancing and strengthening the systems that support early education, whether it's the foundational aspect of Head Start, um, access to high quality center-based childcare programs, but the incredible and necessary role that the IDEA early childhood programs helped in making sure kids get the services in those settings that they need to be successful. So continuing to build on that, uh, I think the president's um, appropriately placed a high priority on childcare. Childcare has to be a place where kids learn and thrive and where parents get the supports to support their children to learn and thrive. And, and that helped, happens with well-trained staff um, and, and staff that are grounded in child development in, and, and that's, that's one of the things I hope we can see um, continue to grow under this under this administration. Um, uh, one of the things that's always been a concern to me and the department collects um, really important data on uh, suspension and expulsions and trying to have those numbers go down as fast as we can um, so that we aren't kicking three-year-olds out of preschool because of behavior problems um, that we're equipping the adults in that building to have the supports, to have the training, to understand um, when a kid's got trouble at home that it's gonna manifest itself in behavior at school, um, that we don't just kick that kid out and think that we've we've made progress. I, I hope we can continue the good work that's been done in the past on trying to shine a light on these problems so that we can actually partner with states and localities on the solutions. Um, I also think that, you know, you're absolutely right that that this past year has been hard on everybody, um, but it's been especially hard on kids with disabilities and kids of color. And, and we, as the education community, working hand in glove with parents, I think we all have to understand that everyone needs to come to the table with the best of best of intentions and figure it out together. There's no magic wand to make up for this lost time, but there is uh desire and commitment to do it and we need to work together to make sure that um, 
you know, at the end of the school year, we feel really good about um, what we've been able to do to support states and LEAs in their journey on this, and that parents feel like um, the school folks um, have their back and want the best for their kids, because we know that's true. It may not always come out. I love how you talk about this work and you keep children at the center of everything you're saying. And I'm kind of reflecting back on what you asked about the increasing shortages in personnel. You cast such a beautiful vision about what's necessary and how hard this is going to be. Um, but we can do hard things with Absolutely. the right wise actions. And I'll say again that the teaching profession has never been a more important profession to enter into. And I think I have to humbly submit that is the most rewarding profession that someone could take on. So we have to ensure to deliver on that vision that you just talked about, that our teachers know they belong here, they belong in this profession, kids are waiting for us, and they're counting on passionate teachers that can provide the support. And I want people to know help is here. The American Rescue Plan invests in teachers and, and the needs that teachers have. And the American Families Plan supports long-term sustainability of this in investment. And my experience from California, I'm bringing to the table, it's important as a leader that we give attention to the development of our personnel. It's to not only get teachers in the door, but to show the pathway for growth and investment. And, and that's what we do. So I think you can tie all that together. And um, we would be wrong if we would have this beautiful conversation, you and I, Katie, and not talk about the critical partners that we need to do this work. And the, a critical partner in the work is our parents. I'll ask that question for my mom and start with her because I saw my mom's role in Charlie's life and all of the students that I've served in my 32 career, 32 year career. I know how important it is that we work with our parents. So maybe coming from your most recent experiences, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on engaging parents as partners as we move forward? Sure. Um, two things. Um, one is, uh, I, I think, uh, really listening to parents about what they what their vision is for their child and their family, um, having an understanding of that. And I think for school-aged kids, um, whenever I'd, a friend would ask me to go to an IEP team meeting, um, I would always try to have the everybody in the room uh, identify um, at the beginning of the meeting a strength of the child because it sets the tone of not just talking about deficits not just talking about what may be but really acknowledging that this child has value this family has value that we're doing is developing a unique plan to help this specific child and that that simple act which doesn't take a lot of time um, really does help ease the tension of of the the them and us feeling that sometimes happens when you're sitting in an IEP meeting. Um, and I don't think that's anyone's intention, but it's certainly um, it can be a feeling. I'll never forget the first day of kindergarten when I took my daughter uh, and and I'd been an advocate for a long time for other people's kids. My daughter doesn't have disabilities, but she was horribly bullied in elementary school and in, in high school. Middle school was a dream. Don't ask me why. Um, and and one of the things that was really important to us as a family was the the school um, psychologist. And you can't forget the specialized uh, service personnel, the OTs, the PTs, the social workers, who are an integral part of helping kids be successful. And we place a lot on teachers. Um, teachers have a huge and, and incredibly important job. But we don't want teachers to think that they're there all by themselves and that there are other, other supports um, in large part thanks to IDEA. So there are um, people with, with knowledge that can be good partners in helping kids and families and teachers um, along the way. And I, I think that's one of the big things we want to do is we don't want anybody to feel that they're doing this all by themselves on their on, alone and that there are services and supports for the professionals in the education system, as well as for the families and the kids, um, and that together we're, we're all in this together. Katie, I love how you, you just share really on the ground experiences and again, keep the children at the center and the idea that when you start an IEP meeting, you would always encourage everyone in the room to just start with the strengths and that this is a strengths-based approach, not a deficit-based approach and really know the, the child and their story and family brings so much information and what the family knows 
about a student matters and it's an equal what you know not an us versus them but an us and us environment one of my favorite things i used to do as a teacher was ask parents over the summer to write me a letter about their child send me a letter and tell me what do i need to know about your child and i received some of the most beautiful letters of families sitting down to say here's what you need to know about julia or charlie or megan and they would tell and i still have these letters to this day in fact i'm starting to reconnect thanks to social media, Facebook, I found students that I taught years ago, and I'm actually giving the letters back to them now that their families had written to me back when they were in second grade. There's something about these beautiful letters. And when a family tells you what you need to know about a child, you learn things that are so important and essential in that child's growth and development. It's kind of like, how do you become a social anthropologist in our own community to get to know the child and their story and their family history and let parents know that we want them to share their stories. And especially now when our families come back, what did they go through? What were they experiencing? Those stories will matter and they will shape the wise actions that we'll be taking as we move forward with our students. Cindy, given your previous um, long time role as both a teacher and, and an administrator, um, how, how do you feel about uh, the role of the Department of Education in really helping states and LEAs um, get through this next year, which we know is going to be um, unlike unlike any other? Um, what's what's churning in your head in terms of what you want folks to know from from that role that you you had? You know, it's just so important that we bring our experiences and we stay grounded in what we know our students need. I will say that we have to ground our decisions in equity. And equity is, I define equity as each and every student gets what they need, when they need it, in the way that they need it. And that's not decided in Washington, DC. That's decided at the local level with wise educators and teams working together. But everybody has to work with the mindset of delivering on the hope and promise of public education in America happens in a context where there's a commitment to equity and equity happens when you know students by name and by need and you understand their history and their strengths and you def and you design what you're going to do next based on that. So I'm committed to starting that learning for every student from a place of strength what does a student bring into the table? What do they love? What are they great at? How do we help them use their uniqueness to excel? And then this equitable, integrated, sustainable strategies start with knowing, like I said, students by name and by need. And not one person is the sole decider of what that student needs. It's that team approach. So I think as we begin to reopen across the country, we're going to see that students are bringing back with them new skills. And we're going to be able to use those skills to target and create strategies so that we can curb future or further learning loss. And when you get to know your students that deeply, you start to realize that there's patterns that emerge and those patterns will support the solutions that we can build to address the inequities and build a res build responsive program. So it's this dynamic between if we, if every single teacher and IEP team and family works together to know student by name and by need across the country, then we're delivering. But from that will emerge patterns and trends that will help us know which programs should be invested in. As kids come back from the pandemic, we know them by name and by need and we find out a whole group of student needs additional language support or additional right. auditory support or once you find out individual needs, you might see trends and patterns, and that will help us know which programs, what kind of programmatic responses and solutions need to be developed. But I'll caution everybody and say, don't act like, don't pretend to know the answer. Know your students and let the answers and the programmatic solutions come from looking at the trends and the patterns that begin with knowing the children deeply. Mm -hmm. Cindy, one other question I have for you is I've been concerned about just the general social emotional state of too many of our kids. Um, and, and I think the pandemic didn't help. Uh, what, what's your thinking about how, how we as parents, as people in the education system uh, can do to support kids to, uh, 
to regain some equilibrium when it comes to their social emotional health and and looking forward from from that perspective yeah that's such an important question that you asked because i know it's i i want to say it's front of mind but it's actually in our hearts it's like the thing that we are the most concerned about so what do we do to engage that and there's some really great practices around social emotional health and well-being and i think we need to lean in on that mm -hmm. we need to lean in on what are students bringing back with them what they've experienced and i and i say that whether you're a teacher or a parent or administrator wherever you may be in our re-entry i'm asking everybody to be gentle with one another be patient with one another be empathetic and compassionate lean in and seek first to understand what experiences people have had and those experiences might have turned into new strengths that people are bringing and they might have actually made it more more deficits that need to be re, um, de dealt with but at the end of the day if you can understand what people are bringing to the table what they've experienced a lot of times i've said during this lot during the pandemic people keep saying we're all in this together we have to support one another we've got to be able to be compassionate and empathetic and understand what people need and the we're all in this together yes we all have gone through something i don't know that we're all that people have said we're all in the same boat i don't know that we were all in the same boat we've all been in the same storm but everybody's experience has been different and from a social emotional health and well-being start with that and don't assume all deficit assume strength and look at the whole child and look at the whole family experience and figure out how to lean into that and then build your next actions from that. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, one question is, uh, when you were in San Diego and the thought of this coming, um, some of us are thinking, why would you leave San Diego and come to this position? But um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Well, let me just say, I love San Diego, so I'm not going to say anything bad. San Diego is a great city, and if you haven't been there, you should go visit. It is, it, we, it's called America's Finest City for a reason. Maybe we're biased. It's a beautiful place, and I spent a long time there. But this work, in, in what we're able to do now is to deliver on what I say, the hope and promise of public education in America. There has never been a more important time as we reopen our schools and build back better, how are we gonna build back better in a way that will really truly get to what our students need in the way that they need it? I think that's so important that we do that. And I'm excited to be on a team that's gonna be able to serve. It's a lifelong commitment that I've had to education and to our students and to be able to do this work now. My family's in San Diego, but my work and my heart, I'm so committed to this administration and to what we're gonna be able to do for students. When President Biden was sworn in, one of the things he said was, my whole soul is in this. And that's how I feel, is that when we put our hearts and minds and souls into this great work, we can do that. So maybe I'll, with you, um, Katie, how about from your experiences, are there some key messages that you wanna share as we prepare for a full return in the fall? Sure. Um, thank you. And thank you for saying that. I, I couldn't agree more. When I started thinking about this as an opportunity, um, I, I, I have often thought, you know, when we were able to put in the law in, 1980, in 1997 that students with disabilities should have access to the general curriculum. And we really meant it. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't a teaser. It was. It was true. It's in the statute. And um, I. I. You know. I look at the progress we've made in having kids with disabilities graduate with a standard high school diploma. Um, I really want more kids to be graduating with a standard high school diploma. I want more kids to have an idea of what they want to do when they grow up, when they're little, and then act on that. And, and I think to have this time in our history where we're not really starting from scratch, but we have an opportunity to think about things in maybe a different way. And for us to come together and think creatively of, of how things, maybe not everything was great in the past and how can we learn from that and not repeat it or build on the strengths that we know are there. Um, and so I'm just, I'm grateful for this opportunity, Cindy, to work with you, 
and everybody else at the department um, and on behalf of the president so that we can support the people who are going to make this real, the adults in the building, the parents, the kids, and that you know we will look back on this year thinking that we really made a difference. We did what we were supposed to do. So the people who needed our support got it. And I can't tell you how excited I am to be on this journey and to be a part of what I think is going to be a great time in public education where um, everybody gets to be their best and do their best. And we've been we've been there as their partner to support them. That's really beautiful. And I'll say our secretary always says we're going to learn, heal and grow together. And that's what we get to do as a country. And the mission could not be more urgent and more clear at this point. So I look forward to working with you. And I want to say thank you for engaging in this conversation with me today. And I'm so happy for this convening and this gathering. And um, I don't know if my brother Charlie will be watching. Charlie keeps asking, when are you on TV again? When are you on TV again? Because mm -hmm. in San Diego, I was on TV as a superintendent a lot, and he's not quite understanding. So my brother Charlie might watch this, and I'll say hi to Charlie. He always likes when we give him a shout out. And maybe someday, hopefully, you can meet him. He'd love to participate love in a dialogue like this. If we're not centered on students, and if we go too long without talking about kids, we need to check ourselves because that's who we work for. We work for our students. Thank you for this conversation today. It's been wonderful. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Gabriella, and I am on the Dream Student Advisory Board. Um, and today I am going to be here to talk to you about my student experience. Um, so when I, uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is just a little bit about me. Um, I uh, went to school in the late 90s into the 2000s and without aging myself. And um, just this year, I recently graduated from law school. I also have a disability called spinal muscular atrophy which is a neuromuscular disease that generally just makes my muscles really, really weak. So when I was in school, I usually had a paraprofessional with me all the time, um, all throughout the day, just to help with physical things. But I was in fully integrated classes. Um, I was an honor student and I participated a lot in school. Uh, next slide, please. So these are two pictures of me from around the time I started school. Um, I specifically chose them because you can see my attitude already in those two photos. Uh, in the first one, I have my tongue out, and then the second one, I look like I'm telling somebody what I think with my eyes. Um, I think ultimately when I started school, one of the most important things that my parents taught me was to go into school with the attitude of, I can do whatever I say, and if you don't think I can do it because I'm in a wheelchair, then you're wrong and I'm going to show you. Um, and even though I think maybe later on they regretted that I was so sassy, um, I think those skills really helped me uh, while growing up and having to advocate for myself. Next slide, please. So this is me um, when I was in high school. Uh, like I said, I participated in a lot of activities. Um, the first photo is me and a classmate. Uh, I did theater in high school, and so uh, that's me in a weird costume that looks like I'm in medieval times. And then uh, the middle photo is me at prom. And the last photo, um, I was actually lucky enough to go to Italy um, on a class trip when I was in high school. And um, that actually is one of the things I wanted to make sure I mentioned is, um, one thing that my parents really ta taught me um, when advocating for myself was if you were given an opportunity and you think the only thing standing in your way is your disability, say yes and we will figure it out on the back end without you worrying about it. And I think that really, really helped me because there were a lot of things that people assumed I couldn't do and that even I assumed I couldn't do. Um, based on my disability, but um, I was actually able to do a lot of things. Um, and I'm really grateful that I had that um, 
those things taught to me. And I just do want to point out that the last photo is supposed to be us in front of the Trevi Fountain, but I couldn't find a photo. So that's actually me and my dad uh, in Las Vegas many years later. So we can just pretend like that's a picture from Italy. For some reason, I couldn't find a photo. Uh, next slide, please. So in my post-secondary transition, um, it was really interesting because one of the things that I learned to do was not depend on my parents to advocate for me. Um, and, you know, going through school, I always thought that I was the one doing the advocacy, but it usually wasn't me. It was usually me, you know, starting things and then my parents supporting me along the way. Um, and so learning to kind of take the reins myself was a really big challenge for me. Um, one thing growing up that I had to deal with a lot was being separated from other people. Um, even when it wasn't really necessary for me to be separated. Um, there were a lot of pictures that I could have used in the last slide. Um, and most of them were pretty happy, but there were a lot of hard times that I dealt with. Um, a lot of photos that I didn't take, but that are kind of burned into my memory. Like a lot of me being seated way, way, way separately from other people in my choir class while we were singing or, you know, me having to be at a separate table from everybody else because the table that they were at were up a couple of steps. Um, and those situations weren't photos that I really wanted to take at the time. Um, not really happy memories, but I really appreciated, um, you know, what they said in the last um, video, which was just, you know, make sure that the child or the student knows that they have value and knows that they um, are capable and able to participate in things. And I think that's something that I took with me as I got older. So this photo, um, I of course couldn't make it easy. Uh, my parents had a big transition when I was going to school. Um, you know, having me live in a different city, um, and uh, live independently for the first time was not enough of a challenge for me. I also had to go through sorority recruitment, um, which was a lot of work uh, on my end, on my parents' end, and on the end of the Panhellenic Council, which is a big group that oversees um, sorority and fraternity recruitment at my uh, university. Um, I tried to go into it with the same attitude that my parents taught me of just say yes and then we will figure it out on the back end and for the first time I actually saw how much work that was and it was a lot um but I was able to do it and I joined the sorority and it was um just a really good experience uh next slide please so this is um something that's just a general theme um so these are two pictures of me from college. Um, the first photo is me in the middle and then my nurse who took care of me for most of my college years in the pink shirt. And then my aide who took care of me, who's in the black hoodie. Um, they were the, the two people who really stuck around for a lot of my college and um, helped me with a lot of the physical needs that I had. Um, and that was definitely necessary for me to be able to live independently. Um, and my relationship with them is something that I really value. I still talk to them both all the time. Um, and then on the right, um, I was actually lucky enough to move to a city where there was a weirdly large population of people who had my same disability, um, which is a very rare disability. I'm sure none of you guys have ever really heard of it, or if you have, you probably know somebody uh, in particular who has it. Um, but uh, these these women, they really helped me, um, you know, experience my disability in a different way and learn to um, advocate for myself um, in a way that was most helpful. And so it was in college that I kind of started to look back and see how I was experiencing um, elementary school, middle school, and high school from an, from the point of view of somebody who was becoming an adult. So I was able to look back and see, you know, maybe that tactic that I tried where I just blunt forced my way into uh, into situations um, 
and into accommodations maybe wasn't like the best way to do things back then. Um, and so they, they were also really helpful um, to me figuring out kind of how to exist as a person with a disability. Um, so in general, I think two things were always really important to me. Um, and this is in preschool, middle school, elementary school, high school, college, now all of it um, was just the two things that these photos represent, which is making sure that my base needs are met. So making sure that I have somebody to get me out of bed in the morning and, you know, get me to school and help me with the basic things. And then on the right, people who I know are on my team no matter what. Um, and I didn't always, honestly, I didn't always feel like I had that in school, um, especially in middle school, which I think we all kind of felt out of sorts back then um, at that point in life. But I think, you know, learning to appreciate those things when they do exist is really, really important. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that I actually got to do in college um, was I was able to do study abroad in Greece. And we were on an island that was a really small farming island called Seraphos. And on that island, it was just a bunch of farmers who had mostly never been off of the island in their entire life. And some of them for uh, several generations had never gone off the island. And um, there was a really big monastery there. Um, and the monastery was uh, really, really beautiful. And there was a monk there. Um, and I, uh, next slide, please. And so obviously it wasn't accessible. Um, I was told that I was the first person on, in a wheelchair to ever be on the island. I don't know if that's true, but um, that was what I was told. So for the people who had only ever been on the island, I was the first person they ever saw. Who couldn't walk. Um, so to get up to the monastery, I had to be carried up those steps in the background um, and sat on a regular chair. And then when I got up to the top, I was able to be actually be blessed by the monk, which was so cool. Um, it was one, probably the coolest experience I've ever had. It was just so wonderful and interesting. And um, I still can't walk, but you know, I think uh, it was a good it was a good thing. I've had a really good life since then, so maybe it worked. Um, and just in general, I know that this experience, you know, it's not just me in the photos, it's me and everybody who helped me get there. Um, and so I've always been very aware that I couldn't be where I am if it wasn't for the people around me who believed in me. So I'm very grateful for that. And I see that we have a question. Um, how did you gain access to a nurse and aid to travel with you to college? That seems like an amazing support system, but also may be hard to access for some students. Yes, it is very hard to access. Um, so I'm on a waiver program, which is a Medicaid funded um, program that pays for a nurse and an aid, and I had to go through a home health agency. It's really, really complicated. Um, and when I get to the law school part, you're going to hear all about it because that's kind of part of why I wanted to go to law school was to make that situation easier for people. Um, next slide, please. So this is me at college graduation. Um, this uh, is me and my family on the left and then me and my younger brother, John, on the far left. And then on the right, it is me and my aide, who was a couple slides ago, named Chelsea. Um, graduating was really something that was a good experience for me. I, I was so happy to have done it. And I was just honestly really proud that I was able to go through the whole experience and um, frankly, like survive it <laughs> and to be able to stay living independently the whole time, be able to stay on my own and, um, I really felt like my accomplishment at that point was my own um, and, you know, not just something that I did because of momentum from high school. Um, it was really difficult and there were a lot of added issues, um, but it was ultimately obviously a really good experience that I, I'm glad that I had. Um, next slide, please. 
So um, I went through that really fast, but uh, after um, five years of, you know, after college kind of floundering, um, I realized that there were a lot of things that I didn't really like about living with a disability, um, a lot of which were legal barriers that were kind of in my way um, from doing a lot of things, um, including, you know, the difficulty in hiring caregivers and um, just knowing that no matter what, no matter what age I've been, my life experience has been so different from a lot of my peers. Um, and that was really apparent, especially when I was in a sorority. Um, there was one person in particular who was a really, really good friend of mine and we lived just totally different lives. Like her family was very wealthy. They paid her entire tuition and that's awesome. I'm not saying anything bad about that. But um, she didn't have to worry about anything in college. Um, she actually thought, I found out later, that my, that my parents were the ones who hired all my, all my caregivers and it was really me. And so it was really like a job on top of college, on top of more of a job. <laughs> um, so it was, a lot of, it was a lot of work, but um, it really shouldn't be for everybody. And I don't want other people to have to go through the just the amount of strife and issues that I did. So I decided to go to law school and I just graduated. Um, and the first photo is me in the courtroom at my college and the middle photo is me and my fiance at what's called Barrister's Ball, which is like law school prom. And on the right, that was me uh, right after I graduated. And I graduated on Zoom, so I don't have a photo of me, you know, with my family or anything, but it was still fun. I still bought the cap and gown, so that's good. Um, and uh, I think that's my last slide. Oh, no, I'm sorry. What I'm up to now, of course, I still exist. I still have a life. Um, so right now I'm just doing bar prep, which is the middle photo. Those are all the books I have to memorize. Um, the bar is in a week, it's a week from today. So I was really happy to be here with you all. Um, looking back and kind of getting a better perspective before I go into the final stretch of studying. Um, and then on the bottom right, that's the logo for my blog. Um, it's called The Girl Who Sits. And then on the bottom left um, is uh the logo for disabled union and it's a an advocacy group that just kind of got off the ground they're like a grassroots not really political movement but um a movement to try to help uh, make it to where people with disabilities can get married without losing their disability benefits because that happens and that's something i learned a lot about and did a lot of research on in, in law school um and then one message i think that I would give to teachers in the audience is um, trust, like, as weird and vague as this sounds, I think it's really important that when children have disabilities, you should really trust them that they know what their needs are. Um, there were a lot of times where I felt like I had to argue with teachers or with um, other administrators to um, try to say like, no, I really do have this disability. Yes, I really have a lot of difficulty. And just having to consistently restate my, my what, what I saw back then as my flaws um, was just really difficult. It was really disheartening and it was really upsetting for me as a kid to have to, um, you know, talk about what I lacked a lot. Um, it was really hard and really sad to me growing up. Um, and so I think just making sure that you don't take your own personal biases um, and bring them to discussions. And I also really liked what they said in the last video, which was um, start out IEPs with what is a strength of the, of the student. Um, when I was growing up, I used to hate going to my IEP because, uh, you know, it was just an hour, two hour long meeting where everybody talked about all the things I couldn't do and how inconvenient that was for the teacher and for 
the principal and for the administrators and everybody involved. Um, and I think, you know, even in small ways, um, you know, kids hear the messages that you send. So just be really conscious of the way that you talk about disability and the way that you talk about their needs, because um, it's something that they're gonna have to live with for, you know, maybe forever, maybe for a long time. Um, and I just really appreciate you guys hearing me today. And I hope everybody has an awesome day and uh, stays cool and stays healthy. And uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Juliana Urdue. I'm a special education teacher in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm so proud to be the 2021 National Teacher of the Year. Today, I'm so grateful to be here with you all to center students with learning and thinking differences, to center their possibilities and their brilliance. And I wanted to share a little bit about um, my process in becoming an educator, but also in what has helped me sustain my practice and what, what has helped me um, grow my practice. So what helped me become a successful, efficient teacher was having a strong sense and a strong understanding of how children learn and what are the ways that we learn to read, write, compute, and reason about mathematics. These are the building blocks to learning, and I think it is so critical that all teachers have a strong foundation in how we uh, understand these content areas. I know in my undergrad, I felt prepared to build a community of learners. I felt um, ready with praxis and philosophical frameworks of learning, but I wasn't quite prepared with the nuts and bolts of how to teach children to read, write, compute, and reason about mathematics. Um, it wasn't until my uh, my postgraduate studies in my master's program for bilingual special education that I learned, thanks to Dr. Nancy Mathers, uh, about how do children actually learn to read. What is the science behind reading and how do we teach any child, regardless of where their reading skills may be in comparison to their age, how to read? And I think that this is one of the things that has helped me sustain myself as a teacher is feeling the success in being able to meet any child where they are and helping them become readers. Reading is a human right and students with learning and thinking differences often feel challenged. So when I work with my students in third, fourth and fifth grade who are reading at pre primer levels, I understand that they feel hopeless and helpless in their reading abilities but it's my job to uncover where they are in terms of their reading abilities and how to help them continue to grow. The best way to do this is meeting them where they are. And in order to meet them where they are, as a practitioner, I need to be able to carefully assess their reading skills and find strengths in their reading skills. Often this means that we return to phonemic awareness we return to letter names and letter sounds. And I teach them in a way that is multi-sensory, meaning I engage all parts of senses to make sure that my students are one, having so much fun when they're learning, two, they're very aware of what they're learning, three, that they have multiple ways to engage in that learning. And four, that we're doing this in community, that they know that their learning matters to other people and that their skills can often be helpful to other people. And so I think that one of the things that we can do to overall improve um, the teaching effectiveness of students with learning and thinking differences is to ensure that all teachers pre-service and early years um, have access to these uh, methodologies of teaching that engage the multi-senses and also um, are proven to be effective. That we give teachers the autonomy and the freedom to meet students where they are so that they can experience success, um, but also be able to do multi paths. So while we're meeting students where they are with very explicit interventions that are systematic to the, our students' needs, that are sensitive to our, their, our students' um, learning paces, 
we are also exposing them and allowing them to interact in student-led learning in learning that is of interest to them that uplifts their strengths and their values and their interests and so i think that making sure that all teachers have collaboration among other teachers is really critical I learned so much as a special education teacher when I was able to co-teach. In fact, with two different teachers, I was able to share a classroom and share a caseload, and we co-taught. I learned so much from my colleagues. I was supported in areas that I wasn't as strong in, for example, how to teach writing, um, but that they also had the opportunity to learn from me, how to teach behavioral supports, how to teach uh, neural learning, basically, teaching our students about their brains and how to regulate their emotions and regulate their behaviors so that they can become um, successful and contributing members of their community. And so I think that that collaboration is really important. I think it's so critical to teach, um, to support teachers in their early years of teaching. And that, that way, everybody benefits. Students are learning even more. Teachers are feeling sustained and supported in their work. I think any um, person in a leadership position at the state, district, teacher preparation programs, university levels, policy members, I think the biggest piece of advice that I can give them is to ensure that they have teacher voice in any decisions that they're making. Teachers are experts, teachers lead with um, the knowledge that their student voices is are really dictating their choices. And so I think that the more teacher voice that we have, the more teacher leadership we'll have in the profession. And that's really one of the benefits of uplifting our, our profession is really ensuring that it's teacher driven. I'm so proud to be a national board certified teacher. The process of becoming a national board certified teacher helped me not only reflect on my practice and my decision making as a teacher, but it helped me center my students. So I think that that's also really critical in terms of helping adjust and move forward our profession is ensuring that teachers have reflective processes for ensuring that we are continuously working on our craft. My other big tip is what can we take off teachers' plates so that they can focus more so on their students? How can we create smaller case uh, loads and class sizes for our teachers so that they can, they can take deeper dives into the learning needs of each student? How can we encourage more project-based learning, more community-based learning? How can we encourage families to become part of our educational models? I hope that these tidbits and these reflections have been helpful in terms of creating a path forward where all of our students and our teachers experience joy and justice in each part of their learning um, experience. Thank you so much for engaging and collaborating. I look forward to the future collaborations amongst all of us all where our students can feel success, feel proud of their learning, and our teachers feel that same, uh, those same feelings. Thank you so much.